Welcome everyone to Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Today we're going to be talking about the coronavirus and the disease COVID-19. I want to begin by extending our sincerest sympathy to those uh, affected by the disease and wish the recovery. Next slide. Uh, this is a text message I sent out January 30th, and you can read it faster than I can read it to you. So just take a second and read it. <clears throat> so, Back in January, it was apparent that this was uh, <coughs> far too rapidly and making too many people too sick. It, it was the beginning of the pandemic. This is a picture of Dr. Lee. Here he is dying. And this was put on Weibo, which is the Chinese Facebook. And he told people to wish him well. He was the ophthalmologist who was consulted to see the original patient and then saw subsequent patients admitted to Jinian Tang Hospital. As everybody knows, he was censored for this because he used the word SARS. China doesn't like the word SARS used because it's so traumatic, but they later apologized for this. This actually became a meme on Weibo. This is the first patient's eyes. And it was a way of telling people on Weibo saying, we're keeping an eye on you. Uh, the government uh, specifically investigated his death to make sure that he had received the optimum care. And this is typical conjunctivitis associated with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Next slide. This is a, a great picture. Uh, those able to read Chinese will see this characterized as a market. Uh, this is the weight market where the first 14 cases in Wuhan were identified and from whom they identified the coronavirus isolate. Next slide. Now, what happened? Scientists call this a spillover event. In this case, a bat virus, and bats carry over 100 different species of coronavirus, um, and bats are consumed as food, especially in soup. And it's assumed the pangolin, the Asian anteater shown here, uh, viruses isolated from the pangolin are almost identical to the viruses isolated from humans. And they feel likely this uh, unfortunate creature was the intermediate between bats and people. Um, these are a delicacy in Asia. Years ago, before they were endangered, I was actually had one for dinner, part of one for dinner. They're quite tasty. They taste uh, very much like chicken. Next slide. These spillover events occur variably. And in modern day America, our greatest threat is actually from spillover viruses from other species, specifically influenza, but certainly coronavirus as well. On December 8th, Dr. I. Fen reported nine patients with what he thought was SARS to the Centers for Disease Control for China. They dispatched a team. By December 20th, there were 60 patients at the hospital. They returned with their specimens. On December 24th, Zhang Jishin, MD reported that there was a new agent 
and the Chinese said they had not had a previous isolate and they were working on it. On December 29th, it was sequenced. It was in the corona family. It shared much similarity with the SARS virus and the World Health Organization was notified. At that time, just Jiantan Hospital alone had 266 patients. Li Wenyang emails Wai Bo and other MDs to warn them that he thinks he's dealing with SARS. Um, on New Year's Eve, an epidemic was declared by the People's Republic of China and volunteer physicians sent to assist. January 4th, Dr. Li was warned to quit putting this stuff on Weibo. Later, the government apologized. January 10th, Li was febrile. January 20th, Sinobish County in Washington State had the first case in the United States. And I think that's a tribute to the physicians there to recognize that this was indeed the novel agent in China. And secondly, notified their health department, and third, began contact tracing. By January 30th, there were 10,000 known patients in China. A PCR test was available, and the World Health Organization declares an emergency. On February 7th, Dr. Li dies. On February 26th, community spread was documented in the United States with R0 greater than two. For those of you not familiar with R0, R0 is used to designate how many people an index case is likely to infect. And that initial identification said it was greater than two and parts of Wuhan it approached four. Next slide. Meanwhile, back in the US, uh, our early warning network uh, was being damaged by budget cuts. Uh, the CDC budget in 2015 was 15.3 billion. In 2019, it was 5.3 billion. So when we get upset with the CDC, we need to remember that they're working on a third of the budget that they had. And in this situation, your senior people are going to be the ones that leave for other opportunities. The National Security Council had a pandemic preparedness team. Their job was to identify pandemics early and prepare the United States for a pandemic. Uh, the two viruses targeted by them, or three, were influenza, Ebola, and coronavirus. It, that was closed December of 19. And on Twitter, uh, Mr. Bolton said that, who was partly responsible for this, he said, claims, claims that streamlining impaired our defense are false. Uh, one might now question that statement. The United States Agency for International Development had a PREDICT program. The PREDICT program was unique in that it paid local people and scientists to uh, find dead animals, and try to isolate viruses, et cetera. While they were in existence, they isolated over a thousand unique viruses um, and warned people specifically, and I'll get to that, about the threat that influenza and coronavirus posed. Our president said he would view it as something that surprised the world. But as we go on, I think a lot of people were aware of this, but didn't, weren't able to connect the dots. Next slide. This is a National Security Council uh, unclassified report. Um, it's available to the public. Next slide. Every five years, they issue an update. Uh, 
the 2020 update, which predicts to 2025, has a black box warning, which is similar to the black boxes we see when we reference a drug on the physician's desk reference or on drugs.com, et cetera. And that black box warning was very specific. It said the emergence of a novel, highly transmissible and virulent respiratory illness for which there are no adequate countermeasures could initiate a global pandemic. Highly pathogenic flu is the likely candidate, but other pathogens such as coronavirus have this potential. And I thought that a very interesting part there. Waves of new cases would occur every few months. The absence of a vaccine and lack of immunity would render whole populations vulnerable. Next slide. This is a, an electron microscopic picture. On the right side, you see a typical coronavirus. Corona means crown in Latin. And you see in the very center, there's a little black area that the viral spike is binding to. And that area is actually the ACE2 receptor. And through that spike, which is very much, it's hollow like a syringe needle, the virus is about to eject its contents into the host cell, and the black parts are the single-stranded RNA. Now, to sort of talk a little bit ahead, the single-stranded RNA codes for some proteins that are very pro-inflammatory. Next slide. It's a coronavirus. It's an enveloped single-strand virus positive RNA, which means it's directly transcribed into protein. It's 0.1 micrometer in diameter. Its replication is by subgenomic RNA, and then it breaks down into smaller pieces inside the cell where they're translated and then reassembled. One specific protein, protein 1, actually is a cleft in the ribosome and stops other RNA from being translated. Now, this is an important point. Single-stranded RNA has a substantial amount of guanosine and uridine residues. These are clearly immunostimulants. Through toll-like receptors, they stimulate TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, and that should be interleukin-1. I apologize for the misspelling, IL-1. And these are triggered through the mediators of toll receptors. Next slide. This is a schematic of a virus, and we see actually a couple of targets for antibodies. One would be the membrane protein, which sticks out a little bit through the lipid coat. Another one would be the hemagglutinin glycoprotein. The envelope itself is lipid, non-immunogenic. The nucleocapsid contains the single-strand positive RNA, and it's bound up with these nuclear proteins. There's also a smaller membrane protein, which is often not exposed, going clockwise to the upper left. So it's probably not a good target to elicit an immune response through a vaccine. Next slide. Now, how do we catch it? Most people now feel that it's inhaled through the nose. Uh, this is backed up, very elegant research, mapping the mosaic nature of ACE2 receptor. And the ACE2 receptors are very prominent in the nose, less prominent in the pharynx. Next 
in one Chinese study where marmosets that are very susceptible to the virus were exposed, one group had their mouth taped shut, one group had their nose taped shut. The ones with their mouth taped shut were only infected at a 50% rate, whereas those that inhaled through the nose, virtually every mal uh, marmoset was infected. On examination, it appears to enter through the Kieselbach vascular plexus, a plexus in the nasal septum of five, the coalescence of five different small arteries. And it is a very abundant site for the ACE2 receptor. And it's thought that that's how the virus gains access to the bloodstream. And recall when it does that, it initiates an endotheliitis. The second thing it does as it tracks down the mucosa, it allows microaspiration into the lungs. So that when we look at this, we have an idea that we actually are dealing with two phases of illness. Early on, there's a clotting derangement. And I use derangement in the mathematical term, where a derangement is where you take one part of an equation and change it to the other side. So what happens is we get blood that's clotting much too soon. And that accounts for the vascular complications of stroke, MI, limb ischemia, et cetera. That's followed by a later immune response, which probably is a combination of innate immunity and a hyperimmune response to the RNA residues. This produces the pneumonia, the pneumonia, I should not pneumonia, the ARDS uh, symptoms of the illness with leaky capillaries. Next slide. Now, Dr. Lakshmi is going to go over this in more detail, but I want to make a few points. Although viral replication is shown here going past day 11, it, as far as we know, it usually goes through day eight after the onset of symptoms, and after that can't be cultured. Here, we're giving ourselves a little margin. Notice at the very top, is viral debris. Because the RNA is products are disassembled, when they're ejected from the cell, you have viral debris, which make your nasal swabs positive, even though you're obviously not contagious anymore. So after eight days of symptom onset, you're not essentially contagious, we take that out to day 10 or even 14 to be uh, out of an abundance of caution. Now, below that, you see the amplification of the immune system and immune dysregulation with T cell dysfunction and also some B cell dysfunction as well. Since this can complications can last a while, we encourage anticoagulation in people out 30 days from the onset of illness. But it makes the point there's two diseases. There's a viral disease and there's an immune disease. Next slide. Pathophysiologically, Endothelium is a paracrine organ. Now, what does that mean? An endocrine organ affects distant cells, whereas paracrine organs infect adjacent cells. And here you see a star. You see uh, around the blood vessel on the top, you're starting to see some cellular debris accumulate as cells die off. 
And then at higher magnification, you see viral debris actually interrupting the action of the endothelium. And that classic Lancet article referred to it as endotheliitis. And that actually is the underlying pathophysiology anatomically. Next slide. This is a more specific example. Um, this is from Tulane University. It was the first autopsy done in the US. Notice adjacent to the artery in the center uh, bottom of the slide, you see adjacent uh, infarction. And here we have, I think, a good example of the macro example of the endotheliitis. So this patient actually died of a myocardial infarction. Next slide. Here, we see evidence uh, on the far right side, there's a, a ghost cell, which has actually been killed by the virus. And to the left, you see an infected cell. And we realize now that not only are there ACE2 receptors on endothelium, there's also ACE2 receptors on some myocardial cells. So you can actually get the complications that are not only vascular, but also at the cellular level. And this accounts for the myocarditis that we see associated with so many of these unfortunate cases. Next slide. This is the genome uh, sequenced first by the Chinese, then uh, they release the sequencing, uh, but not the virus. But by January 30th, we had our own viruses to sequence. The initial sequencing, I believe, was done at the Patel National Laboratory and shortly thereafter at NIH. And they found that this virus, uh, number one, uh, was not in any way designed. It's a result of natural evolution and recombination. So this idea that this was a bioweapon makes no sense. And that you didn't have a defense for. It codes for 28 proteins. Four of them are structural. In other words, these different spikes we see. Eight are accessory proteins that help with replication. But the non-structural proteins are the real villains here. These are the proteins that are very much associated uh, with the single-stranded RNA. Next slide. Now, I have a star, an asterisk, by the non-structural proteins because of what they do. Number one, when a virus infects a cell, the first thing it does is send a message to the adjacent cell to produce interferon, which literally interferes with viral replication. That's blocked by the number one structural protein. Another one inactivates natural killer cells. Uh, that protein is taken up by a natural killer cell enters the nucleus of the natural killer cell and in a way activates through an NK pathway a steroid-like reaction which makes the NK cells at this stage not respond. Cells also undergo apoptosis or cell death they literally commit suicide to stop these viruses from hijacking the replication equipment. Apoptosis is blocked by this non-structural protein. And finally, they open the molecular cleft between the 60 and 40S components of the ribosome, 
and they stop normal cellular proteins, among them interfering, interferon stimulating agent, etc., from being transcribed. And the only thing that will fit into that ribosome is the RNA of the coronavirus. So like I said, this is a very complicated pathogen. It's almost as complicated as HIV. Uh, it has numerous effects at the molecular level. Next slide. This is what happens with the hyperimmune response later on. Hyperimmune response often associated with age, I'm probably triggered by the fact that someone at my age has probably had exposure to over 100 coronavirus infections. It causes 25% of the common colds. Here you see the ground glass opacities described, and the lower black areas actually point to areas of pulmonary infarction caused by clotting within the lung itself. So we have two mechanisms at work. We get um, leaky vasculature, and patients literally drown in their own secretions. And they also have a sepsis-like picture at this stage. Next slide. This is typical ARDS on the left. And this is a proliferative stage where in DS cases resolve with some fibrosis, but it's less clear how this resolves with COVID-19. One thing we found is that patients with COVID-19 can develop a bacterial superinfection. And here you see remarkably congested lung tissue with polymorphonuclear infiltrate, and this patient actually has a bacterial superinfection on top of COVID, which is going to give you quite a grim prognosis. Next slide. Now, how is it spread? I'm sort of going through this quickly because I want to leave some time for questions, but I feel this debate about airborne versus droplet uh, is wrong. There should be no debate. Airborne is often an engineering term and looks at things suspended for 24 hours. Well, for a physician, it really only needs to be airborne for 30 minutes to expose a lot of people. Large droplets fall within six feet. Smaller droplets can travel probably 30 feet. Next slide. To give you an idea of the amount of viruses released, these people simply had infected individuals breathe and run it over um, viral growth material and they for tissue cultures, and they found that they ex exhaled. 10 to the fifth viruses a minute. That's one reason these patients are so contagious. With influenza, you probably expel uh, 100 viruses a minute. To 100. Many more. Next. Now, we talked about it entering through the nose. And here I've illustrated Kieselbach's plexus, which is fairly anterior. And this is how the virus gets into, presumably, gets into the bloodstream. Now recall that everything I'm telling you now is subject to change tomorrow. Uh, simply going to Google, will show you that there's well over 300,000 papers published so far and abstracts on this illness. But we believe it enters through Kieselbach's plexus, and that gives um, the paracrine derangement that results in clotting. 
that also is a source of trouble because we often see people wearing masks over their mouth and not their nose. Well, they're not doing anything except ensuring they get infected um, and they can infect other people. Next slide. Now, do we have any empiric data on this? Yes. The Diamond Princess was stuck in Yokohama. They had no masks. People were maximally affected. And if you look at some of the blogs, they're tragic. Uh, crew members blogging that they're waiting to die. People sent home, sent back to their cabin to quote, isolate with their two roommates, things of that nature. Only 20% of the Diamond Princess cases were asymptomatic. On another vessel, the Mortimer, which set sail on an Antarctic cruise, came after the Diamond Princess, or left out of Ushuaia, Argentina, and they were prepared they had masks, they had gloves, they had gowns. The second, the first patient became ill with a cough. Everyone on the ship was required to wear a mask outside their cabin. And what we think happened in this case was that people got much lower viral loads, and as a result, we're able to deal with it through innate immunity Muco, uh, in mucus, the different uh, chemicals that kill viruses are present. We have nasal cilia brushing mucus out of the nose, natural killer cells, etc. All of them wore masks. 80% of the people that got off that boat were positive for the virus, but asymptomatic. So we think viral load has a lot to do with infectivity. And also emphasizes that wearing a mask is the best strategy. Next slide. I'm now going to turn this over to Dr. Kim. The area of testing is very complex. Dr. Kim is far more intelligent than I am, so I'm going to let her deal with this intellectually challenging process. Dr. Kim, are you on? Yes, thank you. Next slide, please. So uh, John's gone over a lot of the basics of pathogenesis, um, and the, the, the diagnostics is very linked to the biphasic um, disease process. So it's thought now that the incubation period for the virus is, prop, is up to two weeks, which is why people are asked after they're exposed to um, self-isolate for two weeks. But in reality, most people probably become symptomatic within a week. And that you are infectious, probably it's like many viruses, probably the day before you become symptomatic. And then um, afterwards you're infected for you're in, you're infected and infectious for some period of time. Um, so uh, it's very complicated because not everybody who has detectable virus is symptomatic. Um, and what we are now realizing is that um, many of the people who have clinical disease and actually um, have detectable virus may not be actually infectious. And that's true for two reasons. Uh, number one, um, your body is trying very hard to kill off the virus. So the virus, um, th so there's probably a lot of dead virus detected with these very, very sensitive tests. Um, and then also RNA viruses tend to uh, not make completely competent virus. So you'll see a lot more nucleic acids um, when there actually is an active virus there. So it looks like in most people who are immunocompetent, live vir infectious virus is unlikely um, to um, 
be present for um, for more than eight or nine days. Uh, we are a little bit more compromised, um, so they may shed virus for an additional week. However, your PCR test, so on this graph, um, the PCR test is that blue line. You can be positive for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, then um, as your immune response occurs, uh, you can see um, the, the graphs with the dotted lines, and those are when, when antibody will um, come up, and then usually IgM develops first, IgG develops later, and the IgG antibody is what's associated with protection. And there are many things that we don't actually know. Uh, most people will take presence of antibody as a surrogate for protection. It definitely seemed like in all the studies that as your antibody response goes up, your viral load goes down. So it's a reasonably good assumption, but whether that correlation is perfect and the actual duration of antibody is unknown. So all of this is pretty complicated and you probably, um, even for those of you who are medically oriented, it all becomes very confusing. The gold standard for measuring um, respiratory viruses, including influenza, is what's called the nasopharyngeal swab. And you can see in this um, picture from the New England Journal of Medicine, that involves taking a long, thin, flexible swab and sticking it in the nose and all the way back to um, the, the, uh, phary the pharynx. Um, and so that obviously, just looking at it, is something that will cause cough, gagging, and things like that. So is relatively high risk for those trying to collect the swab. So this is why um, personnel collecting the swab have to gown and glove and wear eye protection and masks to collect the specimens. So even though that's the gold standard, um, you know, there are other ways of getting the sample, um, and those are nasal swabs, oropharyngeal swabs, saliva, saliva. And those three methods are potentially collectible by the person who might be infected, and the reason that they aren't used more frequently is that pretty much all studies have shown that the samples may be a little bit more difficult to deal with and be less reliable so that you may have false negatives. So that's why the gold standard is the nasopharyngeal swab. Next. Oops, I think I missed a slide. But um, so why don't you back? Actually, I don't I think move on to one slide. I think maybe the slides are out of, uh, looks like we skipped slide. Go back. Um, go back one more. So, um, so the gold standard of testing is um, the RT-PCR test. Um, and I'm sorry, there was a schematic of the different tests available. And that is a PCR test that detects nucleic acids. Um, so that's the gold standard test. There are other tests that detect the antigen, so that's the protein made by the virus. Those are generally technically much easier to perform, so they can be incorporated into those lateral flow tests or point of care tests and things like that. Those are pretty good, um, but are definitely less sensitive. Um, the advantage being for them is that they um, are usually much, much easier to do. So when you're looking at diagnosis COVID-19, COVID it's always a, um, a balance between having the gold standard test, which is more difficult to collect the specimen and more difficult to, do, to um, perform the test versus something that is easier to collect and easier to test. And this is a little bit of a controversy as to what is the optimal test. Most of us, since we feel fairly strongly that everyone should be diagnosed, still recommend the nasopharyngeal swab. But this is an involving area. Next. All right, you probably also heard about pooled testing. So as you know, in the early era of COVID, it was hard to get a test. 
and there were supply chain problems all the way up and down. So you couldn't get the swabs, you couldn't get the viral testing media. If you could get that, the lab maybe didn't have enough reagents to do the testing. So another schema to do a lot more testing is pooled testing, which has been implemented in many settings. And that was first developed to screen draftees for venereal diseases in World War II. You can use a whole bunch of different assays. And PCR is particularly um, appealing because the sensitivity of PCR is very, very good. So even if you dilute samples a fair amount, you are still likely to pick up a signal if um, someone is positive. So the idea is you pull samples um, from a bunch of different people together you assay the pool, and if the pool is negative, all individual samples are negative. If a pool is positive, at least one sample is positive. And then what you have to do is go back and test the samples of the individuals in that pool. Um, so that is something that is being explored. Um, in fact, is actually being done on the USF campus to do some surveillance. Um, the, the main problem with that is obviously Obviously, if the background prevalence in your community is fairly high, the pooling doesn't save you much time or reagents. Um, so um, next slide. Now, you've heard a lot of stuff about serologies, and you notice that I haven't really talked about serologies. Um, the main thing about um, testing is right now you pretty much need a test that detects the virus for most of the needs that we need. Um, so I would recommend either a nucleic acid test, um, the RT-PCR test, or an antigen test. But a lot of people are very interested in when is the ser serology test useful. Um, we've done some analysis at TGH in collaboration with the CLIA certified lab. It looks like the lab-based serology tests perform quite well. Um, there are depending on the test platform, some problems with cross-reactivity with other coronaviruses, but the test that the TGH lab chose, which is the Abbott test, seems to have a relatively minimal amount of cross-reactivity. We have also, in looking at both employees and at inpatients, most patients will have um, IgG formation by 14 days, and, um, and the vast, vast majority will have um, IgG formation after 21 days. So in a case where a patient presents after that first week where the nasopharyngeal swab could be negative, but they still could have COVID, then we found that um, a serology test is often useful for people who come up with the um, post-COVID sequelae. Um, serologic testing is like population epidemiology studies, and right now, the lateral flow assays um, that are like the pregnancy tests um, have a problem with both false positives and false negatives, so we wouldn't recommend those. Um, and so um, I'm happy to answer questions later on, but we're um, a little bit over time for my section. So why don't we move on to Dr. Lakshmi? Hello, everyone. And uh, um, this is my title, um, but I'm also very proud to be part of the COVID Avengers team, the COVID Daily Squad, the Tampa General, with Dr. Kami Kim at the helm of it and our ICU critical care team and hospitalists. So we're going to discuss a little bit of the treatment. As you probably all know, this is a moving target. Um, in fact, I was looking um, on uh, looking at an article and every two minutes when I refresh the Google Scholar page, a new article pops up. Um, so definitely there, there is a lot that we still need to learn around this. So moving on, we're going to talk, I know this slide is extremely busy, uh, but I wanted to focus on things that are hypothesis generating and things that are practice changing. So in this slide, we'll briefly go over things that truly are hypothesis generating and there are many studies ongoing in this area. The figure on the, uh, on the right side shows you essentially the binding of virus, the entry, the replication, how it takes over the human machinery and generates its own copies and possible targets in each one of those steps. Um, 
the one that I put on the on the left hand side, some of the names of the compounds, camostat, mesylate, is essentially a serine protease inhibitor. Where you can see next to that cup-like ACE inhibitor, there is an orange-colored um, uh, serine protease um, membrane protein that activates the spike protein. Um, so blocking that is one thought. Arbidol is an um, influenza medication um, that's thought to decrease adsorption. Seritinimab is part of the immunological blockade. Um, glyco uh, glycosyrrhizin is um, a part of licorice, has some antiviral activity. And then the famed interleukin-6 inhibitors, as you can see, have a, have a huge impact on the cytokine pathway. So next, going on to practice changing uh, medications, um, one that has been much in the news, much spoken about, uh, much debated, is the convalescent plasma study. And um, we were part of the Mayo Clinic Expanded Access Program. Um, some of the, we still need more robust studies on this um, to actually know the impact, but the preliminary experience from Mayo Clinic shows high titer plasma and early in the disease course is likely to be helpful. Moving on to remdesivir needs no introduction. Um, this was available, available through the FDA uh, emergency use authorization. Essentially its claim to fame is decreasing time to clinical recovery uh, and thought to be more effective early on in patients with low oxygen requirements. Um, and then Decadron um, was part of a nicely done RCT and here, um, as you're aware, the number needed to treat was shown to be of benefit when you used it in patients who are requiring oxygen. One caveat to point out that in patients who did not require oxygen, it did show in this trial uh, benefit. In fact, the, the, um, the line was on the other side of the, uh, in the forest plot, showed perhaps harm. Moving on, um, to um, a, an agent that's much in the picture here. Uh, on the figure, you can see it's a, a Regeneron uh, company that has a study uh, looking at monoclonal antibodies to see if that really impacts the, the binding and preventing of um, further clinical illness. So um, mechanistically, it's sound. And if you look at history of infectious diseases, the use of monoclonal antibodies definitely has a huge potential. And um, based on very recent press release, it sounds like it has a trend towards decreasing the viral load and reducing hospitalizations. Now, the great news is that of all the compounds I've discussed, um, we have been um, really fortunate to have majority of them be available for patients at Tampa General, and truly it's kudos to the team that's put it together, including the Office of Clinical Re Research, but also Kami, Dr. Kami Kim, you saw her speak. She's nationally recognized and is a PI on the Regeneron study. So looking at the fact with what this press release is telling us, early um, benefit, and the fact that we have it available uh, for patients at TGH, but also outpatients and household contacts, of COVID-19 that also don't need to be admitted to the hospital are, are candidates for this um, randomized placebo control study. Um, one thing I did want to emphasize and something that we have learned throughout this process is that timing is everything. Um, and um, most of us who have been on service in the COVID team, uh, Dr. Myers' team, um, and Dr. Kami Kim, many of you are on the line, realize that much of what we do is um, geared towards doing it, doing the right thing, but also doing it at the right time. Um, it's, a, it's key that we understand where the patient is in the, in the, in the story of COVID-19, because what we do depends on that, which part of the story they are. So moving on to the next slide, if you see here, you will see on the, um, on the x-axis, the time course, and the y-axis, severity of illness. And you've seen the slide before in Dr. Sinnott's um, uh, part of the presentation. And it's absolutely key, as you can see, the first phase is really dominated by the viral response, the viral replication. 
the action of innate immune system and then it goes settles down in your lungs and then there's a pulmonary phase and then when it goes beyond the lungs there is a hyperinflammation phase um, and as you can see in the bottom of the slide really anti medications with antiviral properties perhaps you know have better benefit early on in the disease course so they can stop that stimulation of the hyperstimulation of the immune system moving forward um, also, especially important transplant patients is um, ability to decrease immunosuppression to the feasible levels. Um, and then as you move on into the hyperinflammation phase, really stopping that hyperactivation of the fibroblast, the bradykinin system, the, the interleukin cytokine pathways, uh, and preventing the patient ending up in multi-organ dysfunction is key. And that's where you see the steroids, the immunomodulators, um, being discussed a lot more. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, pass it on to um, Dr. Sinnott for the next slide. As we look at our patients, I, I am very much reminded of uh, 2003, uh, when I traveled to China at the invitation of the People's Republic of China to examine the SARS epidemic. And recall that SARS killed so quickly, it never got a chance to become a pandemic, although it tried. Uh, when we discharge patients from the hospital, we assumed that they were in good condition. But when revisiting five years later, they weren't. 15% want oxygen. 12% uh, needed one or both hips replaced because of thrombosis of the ligamentum cap. 8% um, had a neuromuscular disorder. 1% had cognitive issues. This looks at a 90-day follow-up here. And you notice all of these side effects are persisting. And the suspicion is growing that we may indeed have more trouble cleaning up after the pandemic and managing a lot of clinically ill patients who can't lead productive lives and are suffering. Uh, this would have a huge impact on society and on the practice of medicine. Next slide. Now, how is this going to end? I think at the end of, this is my opinion, at the end of 2021, it's going to become an endemic disease. The reasons for this are 25%. Uh, people are not wearing masks. I don't understand that. Uh, people go into high-risk environments like restaurants and gyms. Uh, even though they shouldn't know better, 25% is political. If in March we had simply shut down the country for a month, we wouldn't be dealing with 200,000 deaths. Um, we're relying a lot on science. An antiviral agent, not 100% effective, but maybe for post-exposure or prophylaxis. A vaccine, I'm sure you could come up with something to inject somebody with now, but the concept of safety, and you look at many vaccines that have gone astray, it has to be safe and it has to be protective. So think if you had a 60% effective vaccine, you'd take it, but you wouldn't return to going to a restaurant, I don't think, or a gym. Finally, we need a simple screen, a breath test, saliva, something ultimately simple, much less invasive and much cheaper than PCR. And then internal medicine will manage the 10% of patients with persistent symptoms. I want to finish up with a quote from the poet T.S. Eliot uh, from his epic poem, The Wasteland. 
He tells us we know too much and believe too little. Right now, we know we can do much to stop this pandemic by wearing a mask and social distancing. As far as I know, it's the only disease we can beat by sitting at home, laying on the couch, watching TV, and eating Cheetos. Don't go out in public. But the main idea is a mask and social distancing. Thank you very much. We're open to any questions.